physics is simple at times, but this is going to be one of them lessons where it gets really complicated, so I'm going to do my best. In 1988, a new branch of physics opened up. It harnessed the quantum effects and was given the suitable name, Spintronics. So here we go. Welcome to Spintronics. In electronics, we have to grow silicon chips so we can shuttle electrons around. And we are getting actually pretty good at this. In fact, we can grow these chips with very few impurities, and we are actually putting in billions of dollars just to keep everything clean, even to the point where the employees have to wear suits just to protect the chips. Once we have grown them, we can then slice them, dice them into the smallest sizes we can, about the size of a salmonella bacteria. But, as I have said before, and I will say many times again, like everything in science, there are always problems. However, the main one for this is actually money. It costs billions of dollars to make the chips smaller, and well, we are approaching that point where it is so small that electrons can start behaving quantumly, and quantumly jump their way through transistors. But lucky for us, we use silicon, and arguably that is one of the world's most abundant resources. It's absolutely everywhere. R.W. Keynes at IBM in 1988 made a graph. A very particular graph, and you might actually be familiar with this graph. It is the number of atoms to hold one bit of information against time in years. And so he plotted a load of points back then and made a guess of where it was going in the future. And he made pretty dead on, actually. Um, this dot here is for the Pentium 4 processor, and this dot here is for a one terabyte hard drive, and then it's predicted here, uh, in 2007, we're going to reach a point where one atom will hold one bit. That is pretty ambitious, considering it has some implications with thermodynamics. But, we aren't going to let that stop us. There are also some other problems, like environmental issues, like what do we do with all the old machines? People like to have all the latest iPhones and the latest gaming consoles, and they just throw the other ones away. But where do the old ones actually go? As all we want is a smaller and more powerful device, when does the cost start to outweigh the benefits? While silicon is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust, carbon is the 15th, but it is still pretty common, and we have dug some of the world's largest holes in the name of carbon. Holes that are up to a kilometre across and half a kilometre deep, all because carbon is diamond. Just like silicon, we are actually really good with diamonds. We can shape them so that they are shiny and pretty and can sell them for lots of money. And that is the problem right there with diamonds. They are so expensive to buy. With even more questions about where they come from and how they are sourced. But lucky for us and bad news for diamond mines, we can grow our own. Single crystal, almost flawless diamonds in a lab out of methane. And they work great, just like diamonds dug out of the ground. They are both semiconductors and both really hard. So are we about to move out of the silicon age and into a diamond age? That remains to be seen. If you remember back to the transistor video, computers are full of them, and they are 1 or 0, electrons are there, or electrons aren't there. They're pretty simple stuff, and they work in binary logic, but we have a few new ideas. Referencing another video, if you remember back to the standard model video where I explained the spin, this is going to help now. Let me give you an example of what spin is like. In the ordinary world, we have children's roundabouts, and when a force is applied, it will spin quicker, and when a force is applied in the other direction, it will slow down. This is the same in one way, in that electron spin. Yes, that's about it. The wonderful thing about spin as a particle property is that there's no way of changing it. It will always be the same. That is the key point to remember for this part. There is no way of changing the electron spin. It will always be the same. It spins around an arbitrary axis and has a negative value. This produces a magnetic field and it kind of works like a tiny bar magnet, but a quantum bar magnet. It can be up, it can be down, or it can even be superimposed between the two, up and down. Like Schrodinger's cat is both dead and alive in the box, just maddening the unhelpful. Also, if you thought charge was going to have anything to do with this, it's not unreasonable, but it doesn't. Particles that are charged or not can still have spin. But that doesn't mean that they are not affected by the electromagnetic force. That's also an important point. So, electron spin cannot be changed, and it is affected by the electromagnetic force, aka photons. So we spend all our money and time 
and making these perfect silicon chips so they can operate without flaws. But maybe it's the flaws that offer the solution. Maybe we need to change our way of thinking. If we look into the structure of a diamond, it's an isometric hexoctahedral, and it has natural flaws in it. Nitrogen is the most common flaw in diamond, and if we end up with a nitrogen atom in a lattice and then a missing carbon atom next to it, it creates an electron trap, and an electron will get trapped at this point. And then we can use a specific wavelength of light to interrogate this electron and find out its spin. So we can find out the spin of a single electron, one electron at one time. If we then add a magnetic field, we can then influence that spin. The stronger the field, the faster it's going to move, not quicker spin, but the faster it moves from up to down. So what we end up is a semiconductor, single crystal, quantum mechanically active chip. They can be made in a lab to create perfect diamonds and then fire nitrogen atoms into it, effectively smashing it up so the nitrogen atoms end up next to a missing carbon atom. Then you can trap all the electrons. Once trapped, you can then manipulate the spins to your own design. But the spin of an electron is linked to the spin of the nitrogen nucleus as well. You can also send information from the electron into the core and it will store it. So what you have built is a nuclear memory chip. Don't be confused by the nuclear in the sense of radioactivity, just the fact that it uses the atom's nuclei. We can now control this with photons and cut out electrons. This means we don't really have any kind of heating issues that we have in regular computers. And if this makes its way into the server world, then we're not going to have to spend tons of money on cooling all the servers down, so they're going to work a lot better and a lot cheaper, it becomes cheaper to rent your servers. Brilliant for everyone. While spintronics can focus on the spin of a single electron, it can also work with the spin of many electrons. How they all act together to affect the magnetic and electric properties of the material as a whole. Normally, in a material, the electron spins are present equally in both the up and the down state. A spintronic device would require manipulation of the electrons to get them into a spin polarized state, which would result in them being more electrons that spin up than down or down and up depending on which way it's polarized. We can manipulate the electrons in different ways, either by exposing them to a large magnetic field known as the Zeeman effect, or you can use ferromagnets. They are just materials like iron, which can be used to make permanent magnets or are attracted to other magnets. The period of time for which the polarized state can be maintained is known as the spin lifetime, denoted by the letter tau. Not only spin lifetimes are really, really short, less than a nanosecond, but a great deal of research is going into extending these lifetimes. Some of the longest we've got is a few milliseconds, and that's by using a thing called spin dephasing, where the electrons will all have the same spin, but it will slowly come out of sync with each other. Something that comes up a lot in spintronics is the giant magnetico resistance, or GMR devices. Don't get confused though, there is nothing giant about it, it is effectively seen as a very thin layer of conductor. GMR has an impact when conductors are just a few nanometers thick and is sandwiched between two other layers. This is actually used all the time in hard drives. The files are stored as a magnetic code on a disk. Then, GMR is used in the head and reads the code as the disk spins. When the head passes over a magnetic region, GMR will cause the blips of current to pass through the head. In the top layer, electrons are free to spin in any direction they see fit. In the bottom layer, they are only allowed to spin in one particular direction. The spinning electrons in the top layer interfere with those in the bottom layer and make it impossible for the current to flow through the middle layer. In other words, it makes a giant resistor. You see where the giant comes from? A magnetic field can then give order to the electrons on the top and the resistance vanishes. GMR in action. There has also been investigations into antiferromagnetic storage devices. It was found that antiferromagnetic devices can hold bits just as well as ferromagnetic devices. Instead of the normal system where zero is being magnetized upwards and one is being magnetized downwards, antiferromagnetism uses spin configuration. So zero means it's spinning in a vertical direction and one means it's spinning in a horizontal direction. This has some advantages over ferromagnetic devices such that they're not sensitive to stray fields. And it also has a far shorter switching time and it's not affected by nearby particles, meaning that your data is safer than it would have been. I don't feel like I can go into too much detail as it becomes very complex very quickly. It is another one of those subjects which requires years in university to get to grips with, 
but I hope you have more of an idea about what Spintronics is and how it can be used to completely overhaul the technology industry. But until next time, have a good one.